Welcome to lecture 9 of experimental vibration analysis. In this lecture, we discuss the theory for estimating frequency response functions, FRFs, using FFT-based techniques. And the content of this video is found in chapter 13 of the book, Noise and Vibration Analysis. This lecture will cover the two different estimators for single input, single output FRFs called H1 and H2. We will also talk about some important relationships for linear systems. Then we will discuss the coherence function, an important function that can be used to assess the quality of the FRF estimates. We will talk about the errors in FRF estimates and we will discuss the concept of coherent output power. Finally, we will discuss the interpretation of the coherence function. We start by the model we will use for the FRF estimator. We assume that we have a linear system described by the true frequency response H of F. The linear system has an input V and an output U, which are, in the general case, not possible to measure. Instead, we measure the signals X and Y, which are both contaminated by independent or uncorrelated noise, M on the input and N on the output, as illustrated here. Now, in the general case, with noise on both the input and output signals, X and Y, we cannot optimize an FRF estimate. If we, as in the illustration here, assume that the input signal is not contaminated by any noise, we can define the so-called H1 estimator. This estimator is a least squares estimator if the assumption is correct. To understand the estimator, first we remind that the two spectral density estimates of the cross spectral density GYX, which, except for scaling, is the expected value or average of the Fourier transforms Y and the complex conjugate of X. The autospectral density GXX is similarly the expected value of x times x complex conjugate, or simply the expected value of the magnitude of x squared. Now, to find the H1 estimator, we start by setting the equation of the model up in the frequency domain. We thus have that y of f equals h of f times h of f plus the noise spectrum n of f. Next, we multiply the equation by x complex conjugate. The next step is then to repeat those multiplications for consecutive spectrum estimates, for example the blocks coming out of the Welsh spectrum estimator. After averaging, we then obtain this equation. g hat yx equals g hat xx times h plus g hat nx, where the hat, as always, denotes that we're talking about estimates. But the last spectrum, g nx, approaches zero if we average enough. Thus we finally obtain the h1 estimator as gyx divided by gxx. So, we have found a simple estimator for H, and it only relies on the fact that the input signal X is measured without any noise. And you should note that the effect of the noise N on the output is totally eliminated by the H1 estimator. Now, in some cases, cases it's more realistic to assume that it's the output signal that we can measure without any contaminating noise, and that the input is contaminated. We then obtain the H2 estimator, which is also a least squares estimator, if this assumption is correct. The equations are somewhat different, but the principle is similar. Here we multiply the original equation by Y complex conjugate and end up with the estimator H hat 2 equal to GYY divided by GXY. 
Here is an important relationship between the input and output spectral densities of a linear system. Assume as before that x is input and y is output. Then the output y of f equals x times h. Then also the complex conjugate y complex conjugate equals x complex conjugate times h complex conjugate. We now multiply those two together on the right hand side and left hand side separately and obtain this equation which after averaging and scaling becomes this equation. So we have that the output gyy is gxx, the input spectral density, times the magnitude squared of the linear frequency response function. This is a very important relationship between the, the PSD of the input and output of a linear system. Another important relationship for spectra is that the PSD of a sum of two signals is in general not equal to the sum of the PSDs. Here, for example, we have a case on the output of the linear system where the signal y is the sum of u and n. Setting the equation up and multiplying by the complex conjugate of the same equation and averaging, we find that gyy is the sum gyy uu plus gnn plus gnu plus gun. So we obtain two cross spectral densities in the sum. If, however, the two signals u and n are uncorrelated, as they are, of course, in this case, then it follows that g sub yy is equal to g sub uu plus g sub nn, but only as a special case when u and n are uncorrelated. We can now use these relationships from the previous two slides to find some relationships for the H1 and H2 estimators. First, let's assume that we use the H1 estimator in a case where we actually have noise on the input, which we assumed we did not. What happens then? We, will, we get a spectrum GXX, which is equal to GVV plus GMM, since V and M are independent or uncorrelated. Now, also, spectral densities are always larger than zero, so obviously the estimate gxx we get will be smaller than gvv, which we assume it to be equal to, since in the h1 estimator gxx is in the denominator, as we see here, the estimate will be lower than the true FRF. Similarly, for the h2 estimator, if there is actually noise n on the output, then since the spectrum g y y is in the numerator of the h2 estimator, the h2 estimate will be too high. We have thus shown that the magnitude of the true value of h is always in between the estimates h1 and h2. This fact can now be used to define a new function as the ratio of h1 and h2. This defines a function called the coherence function. Note that the coherence function is denoted by gamma squared yx. If we uh, write the equation out, we find that the coherence is equal to the magnitude squared of the cross spectral density gyx divided by gxx and gyy. Thus the coherence must be larger than zero since it's computed from positive spectra and it must be less than one since h1 is smaller than h2. To interpret the coherence we first define the coherent output power which is based on the H1 model. Now, GUU equals GXX times the magnitude squared of the H1 estimate, which is easy to find to be as shown here 
the coherence times GYY. Also, if we want to know the contaminating spectral density GNN, it can be found, found by taking 1 minus the coherence times GYY. From the expression of GUU, we can now find the interpretation of the coherence. The coherence apparently tells how much of the signal Y that comes from X by the linear relationship H, all defined by the power spectral densities. So the coherence, again, tells the linear relationship between the input X and the output Y. If the coherence is unity, there is a perfect linear relationship and there is no contaminating noise N. If the coherence is not unity, there can be several reasons for that. The first and most obvious is that there is noise on the input or output signals, or in both. Note that you cannot know from the coherence function itself if the noise is in N or M, or both. Another reason for a coherence less than one is leakage. Another obvious reason is that the system between X and Y is simply not linear. Then, naturally, there will not be a linear relationship that fully explains Y from X. And finally, although not that common in vibration analysis applications, there could also be the reason that there, are, there is a time delay between the signals X and Y. Some words are necessary here about noise on the input and output signals. How can you know if the noise is on the one or other signal? Well, look at a typical FRF like the one here. At and around a resonance frequency, the acceleration level is apparently high. Thus, the acceleration signal is higher than the noise floor and the noise on the output signal, the acceleration, is negligible. That means that if there is any noise as indicated by a coherence dip, it's because of noise in the input signal. On the contrary, at or around an anti-resonance, the acceleration level is low, and thus there can be significant noise on the output signal. If there is, the coherence will show a dip. A common cause of error when trying to estimate FRFs on mechanical systems is that there is a bias error due to the fact, fact that the measurement time is not long enough compared to the impulse response. This causes a case like the third case in the previous slide, where we described the causes for coherence less than one. To understand this, consider the following figure. The upper plot shows a typical input force and the lower plot the corresponding response signal. Now, you should consider that the output signal is the input signal convolved by the impulse response of the system. The convolution process, as we know by now, includes reversing the impulse response and moving it over time. This means that the first part of the output signal actually comes from samples of the input signal before the measurement started. Thus, the first part of the output signal is not fully correlated with the measured input signal. This will cause some bias error and typically result in a coherence function, which, which is not unity. The longer the measurement time gets, the less this error becomes. Usually, in, in practice, you simply increase the block size and you will see the coherence dips improve dramatically. Another cause of bias error in FRF estimates is, of course, that we are estimating a continuous function by a discrete spectrum, just as for the spectral density estimates that we discussed in a previous video. It can be shown that this error is related to the ratio of the 3 dB resonance bandwidth, BR, and the frequency increment, delta F, when we measure on resonance structures. In the plot here, which can be found in chapter 13 of the book too, results are shown for a simulation 
Now, like for PSD estimation, we eliminate this bias error by reducing the delta F until the error is negligible. So the principle we showed for practical spectrum estimation, where we begin with a small block size and increase the block size until peaks don't get higher, that same principle applies to FRF estimation. Finally, a few words about the random errors in FRF estimates. This error is relatively complicated in detail and is dependent on two things, the leakage and the amount of extraneous noise in the measurement. However, when the coherence equals unity, the random error is very small as only the error caused by leakage remains. This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravibe.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.